Today's TV landscape can be maddening because there's too much to watch, with endless replicas of every kind of show. Yet there's one creation that feels distinctly itself. Irreplaceable and unreproducible, one of a kind. Of course, we're talking about Donald Glover's Atlanta. Robin season takes us deeper inside the mysterious rabbit hole of Glover's mind. So let's unpack the first two seasons of Atlanta and how they've raised the bar for what television can be. Before we go on, if you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all of our new videos. It's in vogue these days to talk about subverting traditional or linear narratives, but Atlanta leaves behind conventional narrative structure more profoundly and thoughtfully than the rest. Its innovations in form have deeper thematic meaning driving them. Season one gives us a setup we've seen before. I don't want a handout, I want to manage you. Then it gradually refuses to deliver what we've been conditioned to hope for by the many stories we've seen that have subtly trained us to expect and desire certain outcomes. This isn't about rap. If we do this right, your kids can live good. My kids can live good. Darius's kids. I can't have kids. I'm sure I'll find out why when the time's right. We meet Ern, a young father who's not really together with Van, the mother of his daughter, Lottie. I was going on a date with some corny dude. Yeah, some corny dude. What? No, this is a great environment for you. Ern is struggling to make ends meet when he sees an opportunity in the budding career of his cousin, Al, the rapper Paperboy. We know that Ern is very smart. He went to Princeton. But we also know that he dropped out. Al's Princeton, by the way. I think I know what happened. I really think you don't. So that tells us he's been missing some motivation or direction. All of this on the surface seems like a perfect setup for a story about a plucky, smart guy rising out of tough circumstances and probably getting it to work with his girl in the process. That's pretty much the story that Glover says he pitched to FX, but it's not the story we see. No, I'm sorry. This is whack. This is... This is whack. We spend the first season struggling to decipher what the meandering, aimless urn really wants out of his life, if he wants anything at all. Then the big reveal comes in the season one finale, the jacket. Urn is mysteriously fixated on recovering his jacket. Where's my jacket? Which we finally learn is because he thinks it contains the key to the storage unit he's been living in. We realize what has been driving him all season. Immediate fear for his survival. Desperation for a roof over his head. Ern has been devoting all his energy not just to finding a place to sleep, but also to hiding how severe this struggle is from everyone in his life. Look, I'm not asking for money. You should be. Ain't you homeless? Not real homeless. I'm not using a rat as a phone or something. Don't be racist, man. In this moment, our initial expectations going into the narrative that this brilliant manager will take the music industry by storm feel completely out of touch because we're given the perspective of a person who doesn't know where he's going to sleep tonight. Season one also grapples with stereotypes through its characters in its own original way. Ern and Vanessa are very aware of types they expect to be perceived as. The deadbeat father who's not supporting his daughter, or the angry black woman. Why are you always turning me into the angry black woman? Because you are. Are you kidding me? I'm the stereotype? Mm-hmm. While well, you're ass, you can't even take care of your own goddamn kid? I'm fine with being a stereotype. It's working out great for me. The more obvious thing for the show to do would be to demonstrate how Ern and Van don't fit these stereotypes, how they prove those damaging labels wrong. But instead, the show is exploring why the characters are stuck in ruts they can't escape, however much they want to. Self-improvement and upward arcs are the lifeblood of American comedies. Look at hits like The Office and Parks and Recreation, which took cringeworthy, unlikable lead characters and turned them into lovable success stories that rewarded audience investment over time. Atlanta doesn't want to participate in this arc. When Ern play acts the perfect boyfriend, she honestly doesn't get the credit she deserves in ever. But that doesn't deter her from being what she is, which is a mother, a provider, and a partner. Van doesn't have an amazing rom-com moment where she realizes he truly loves her. I don't think I could even look at another woman. Instead, she gets upset because this mocking behavior from Ern is so far from what their reality is. Wait, excuse me. Ern 
Hans and Van's relationship doesn't progress, as we see more conclusively in Robin's season. I want to be in a committed relationship where I'm valued as a human being and not as an accessory that you can f I don't know what I want. I, I know this arrangement works for me. Glover said to The New Yorker, quote, At FX, they didn't get Ern and Van at all. I said, this is every one of my aunts. You have a kid with a guy, he's around, you're still attracted to him. Poor people can't afford to go to therapy. Al, too, fits into a type. But the point, again, isn't to make people more comfortable by proving the stereotype wrong. Al suffers thanks to this persona, but he also leans into it and embraces it. Play your part. People don't want Justin to be the asshole. They want you to be the asshole. You're a rapper. That's your job. And episodes like B.A.N. refuse to soften the character's edges. Look, my life is messed up from y'all did, okay? That's black news. You can look that up. Well, your news is problematic. Bitch, that ain't my fault. More than plot, the first season was held together by its tone, which seems to come out of the collaboration between Glover and his frequent director, Hiro Murai. You can even see that tone developing in this early film they did together and in the music videos they've collaborated on. This is America. Season one was pretty formally revolutionary, but Robin's season has taken all this to even more interesting ground. The second season, Robin season, is filled with foreboding, darkness, and threat including from within and from those closest to us. Glover has said people come to Atlanta for the strip clubs and the music and the cool talking, but the eat your vegetables part is that the characters aren't smoking weed all the time because it's cool, but because they have PTSD. Every black person does. It's scary to be at the bottom yelling up out of the hole and all they shout down is keep digging, we'll reach God soon. PTSD is an apt way of talking about the black experience on a broader historical and cultural scale. How do you overcome the PTSD that comes from centuries of slavery? Where are your ancestors from? I don't know. This spooky thing called slavery happened and my entire ethnic identity was erased. As well as on the individual level of a black person who experiences racism today. In Robin's season, we feel the characters dealing with the lingering after effects of trauma. They're finally experiencing some success or progress, but they're haunted by their experiences and not able to escape what's shaped them. They're still trapped. Do you think there's a black lawyer who's as good as your cousin? There definitely is, but um, part of being good at your job are your connections, and black people just don't have the connections that my cousin has. For systemic reasons. Glover has said the thesis behind the show was to make people feel black. He also said, I want them to really experience racism, to really feel what it's like to be black in America. Would you have told us that the school was bad if she really was a regular student? No. If I see a steer smart enough to get out of the pen, I'll leave the gate open. Robin season is looking at the black experience from inside the minds of more of its characters. Ern is absent from entire episodes, and we see him more from the perspective of the other people in his life. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. I'm, I'm not in the mood. Seriously? We see Van's desire for more in her life, her urge to not be defined by her relationships. That's not all that I'm gonna be for the rest of my life, is Lottie's mom. We follow Van to a party where women pay to post Instagram pictures with a Drake simulacrum, or a Draculacrum, if you will. But the understanding and insights she achieves in these episodes don't give her any deliverance from her problems. It's all fake, there's no Drake. So frustration and insight don't get her anything. In a particularly memorable episode, we follow Darius on a creepy adventure into the house of Michael Jackson-esque Teddy Perkins, played by Donald Glover in Whiteface. I just use this to remember things. Darius would like a glass of water when you have a moment. Darius is our guide into the crazier pockets and mini worlds within Atlanta. It's through this character that we understand Glover's statement that Atlanta is, quote, wild westy. Every corner of the city is trying to get by under its own rules. There's no single narrative. This quote explains something to us about the way the narrative of the show itself follows different strands into different worlds to capture the persona of its city.
most strikingly in Robin's season, we see inside Al's mind a lot more. We follow Al without Ern in two separate episodes about normal days that spin out of control, despite his best efforts to stop the chaos and keep a handle on his reality. We feel Al's growing anxieties over stagnation, his fear that he's not taking the right steps when time is limited to truly capture this window of opportunity. In Woods, Al is uncomfortable with the new world he's entering, as embodied by his Instagram famous lady friend, Sierra. People gonna get tired of seeing a sweaty nigga in a polo and cargo shorts. Nobody wants somebody famous to look just like them. After she proposes joining their brands in a fake-ish relationship, We could be good together. We can attach our brands. Ben snaps a photo of him. Al walks off in a rage. But he finds himself attacked by fans, who go after him precisely because he's Paperboy. Man, we love that new song, bro. It's not the first time we've seen his growing status make him a target. I mean, you'll be all right, though. You know what I'm saying? The song hot, bro. It'll probably go platinum or some shit. Bro. I ain't making no money off the fucking song, nigga. In Woods, Al keeps insisting he wants to stay real. Hey, look, no offense, but um, I ain't in all that fake shit. I'm just trying to stay real. But in this episode, he has to face the fact that things have changed, and he can't keep acting like they haven't. Al retreats into the woods where he meets an aggressive vagrant who seems to be a manifestation of Al's mind. You is just like your mom. In dreams and art, woods are a frequent symbol for feeling lost. Dante's Inferno opens with the lines, Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarrita. This piece of Al's consciousness holds him at knife point and insists that he must find a way out of his personal labyrinth. I'm a count to 30. And if you ain't walked out here by then, I'm gonna hurt you. And Al's new resolve gets him out of the woods. And his next interaction with a fan shows us what's changed inside him. He embraces the mechanisms of celebrity, posing for a picture with the boy, and even flashing a bloody grin to play into his public image. Thank you. In the next episode, North of the Border, we get an update on Al's and Ern's professional relationship. Al is observing the difference between experienced managers in his business and Ern's amateurish mistakes. Man, we doing a show in Statesboro for free. Ern spends the episode obsessing over the annoying behavior of Tracy. Perhaps if this were back in season one, we'd be more in Ern's mind. We'd buy into his perspective that Tracy is messing it all up. But we're seeing more through Al's eyes now. And as much of a mess as Tracy is, Al's right when he says, Man, you gonna act like tonight wasn't a bunch of your bad decisions. That bitch, man, that bitch was crazy from the start, man. And you knew that. And you still put me in the same room with her ass so you could save the same amount of money I would have made in an hour or less. In the show we were imagining at the start of the series, this is where Ern would be proving he's a whiz in this business, enjoying their newfound success in some entourage-style montages. But instead, we're seeing people who can't escape their experiences or some of their own bad habits. Ern, who recently spent most of his days worrying about where he'd sleep, can't suddenly switch into a person who understands that it's not worth it to save money on a hotel by bunking with an unstable college girl. Then in the next episode, FUBU, we look back at Al and Ern as kids, and we understand that some version of this dynamic, of Al feeling he's had to shoulder Ern's baggage, has been going on for a long time. I'm serious, Al. I need your help. I'm not cool like you. By this point, we're remembering Al's reluctance to work with Ern in the first season. Oh boy, you think you slick. You coming in here acting like you saving me when really I'm saving you again. And while it seemed odd to us then, now it kind of clicks. I'll just trying to make sure you ain't failing in, in his life. You know, like y'all both black, so I mean y'all both can't afford to fail. In The New Yorker, Glover discussed the way that Ern's and Al's relationship is partly shaped by the differences in how he and his own brother Steven have been treated in their lives due to differences in their skin color. Ern, as the lighter-skinned, book-smart cousin, seems like he has success ahead of him. You're pretty smart, Ern. But he doesn't get how society functions, whereas Al does. Even from childhood, Al has grasped how he's perceived and how to work his place to his advantage. Do you know why you're here today, Alfred? Racism. Now everybody's gonna like me. 
But in the season finale, Ern finally gets Al to see him in a new light when he does what he has to do not to fail. We should hurry. After articulating the crabs in a barrel phenomenon, which gives the episode its title, Niggas do not care about us, man. Niggas gonna do whatever they gotta do to survive because they ain't got no choice. He ain't got no choice either. Al concludes with an affirmation of what his cousin just proved to him. You my family, Al. Huh? And you, you're the only one that knows what I'm about. You give a fuck. I need that. Earn moving the gun into Clark's bag before Clark moves it to Lucas's is even a parallel to how Al saves Earn and Fubu by making the kids think the other boy's shirt is fake. In both cases, someone innocent has to go down. Through Al, Robin Season is also exploring questions of creativity and how the artist fits into today's world. In Barbershop, Al suffers a horrendous day to get a haircut with his go-to barber. But when he finally gets it, that guy is good. And when Al gets revenge for his day of hell by changing barbers, he feels immediate regret because his old barber is an artiste and nobody else compares. The episode could be read as a playful analogy for the difficult artist. Perhaps Glover himself even identifies as such and is aware of all the bad and sometimes crazy that comes with the art. I'm an actor, a writer, and a singer. Some people have described me as a triple threat. But I kind of like to call myself just a threat. In Teddy Perkins, Teddy has been scarred by his father's philosophy that creativity comes from pain. My father used to say, great things come from great pain. Darius counters, What if you would have been great at something else? Or if you would have seen love instead of all the other shit like, like Stevie? And the episode ends with the music of Stevie Wonder, which is a declaration that the best art can and should come from love. Eva, why have you destroyed so many minds? Then in Woods, as we've seen, Al is grappling with what it takes to become a professional in today's world of the arts and celebrity. Woods is about the person of the artist coming to terms with what it takes to move forward in this world and play the game, despite all of its ridiculous elements. All of this may be a way for Glover and the show itself to introspect on how to fit into today's commercial artistic landscape. Atlanta makes us rethink the categories TV has to fit into. It's a comedy that leaves us deeply disturbed and sad. It's packed with surrealism. Glover has called it Twin Peaks with rappers. Yet at the same time, people claim to love it particularly because it feels real. So Atlanta shows how surrealism, when done right, can truly express reality. So as trendy as it's become to be non-traditional in your narrative, Atlanta shows the power of that. By mixing things up, it reveals that the stories we've been conditioned to believe in aren't accurate indicators of how our lives are going to go. In Robin season, we can definitely see that there is a forward-moving, deep story being told here. Yet what's shaping the arc of that narrative is not an artificial act structure or end-game payoff, but what the writers see as reality. It's a story about the frustration of knowing what we want, but not being able to reach out and get it. About the disconnect between our inner selves and a hostile, shallow, treacherous world. About the absurdity of reality. And about the powerlessness we often and feel to change what's wrong in our lives or drive in the direction we crave. All of these feelings are key parts of life that tend to get resolved and fixed for us on the big and little screens. Atlanta has no intention of tying up those threads so neatly for us. And if you don't want to end up like me, get rid of that chip on your shoulder shit. Hey guys, it's Susanna and Deborah here. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new here, please subscribe, tell all your friends, and please consider clicking the bell so you get notifications for all of our new videos. And if you have the means, support us on Patreon.